Hi guys, this is Dr. Ketki, oral and maxillofacial surgeon and I am back with another video on nerve blocks. We have already learnt the inferior alveolar nerve block and the PSA nerve block. Today we are going to have fun with the infraorbital nerve block. So let's get started. If you see the name anterior superior alveolar nerve block, it's the same as infraorbital nerve block. Actually, infraorbital nerve supplies the soft tissues of the anterior portion of the face and not any of the teeth. So it's inaccurate to call it the infraorbital nerve block when our goal is to provide anesthesia to the teeth. So this nerve block doesn't just anesthetize the infraorbital nerve, it also anesthetizes the anterior superior alveolar nerve, middle superior alveolar nerve and the infraorbital nerve along with its three branches, inferior palpebral, lateral nasal and superior labial. If you have watched the video on maxillary nerve, you will know that all of these nerves are branches of the maxillary nerve, which is the second branch of the trigeminal nerve. With this nerve block, the pulps of maxillary central incisor, lateral incisor and canine on the injected side are anesthetized. Along with these teeth, in 72% of patients, the pulps of the maxillary premolars and the mesiobuccal root of the maxillary first molar and buccal periodontium of these teeth are also anesthetized because this is the area that is supplied by the middle superior alveolar nerve which is anesthetized in this block. As infraorbital nerve is anesthetized in this block, this produces anesthesia of the lower eyelid and lateral aspect of the nose and lips. The infraorbital nerve block is useful when we want to perform dental procedures on more than two maxillary anterior teeth and their buccal soft tissues. When there is infection or inflammation, we can't give local infiltration because it will not work. So in this case, this block can be given. Also, sometimes local infiltration doesn't work if the cortical bone is too dense. So when it doesn't work, this block is a great option. This nerve block has some contraindications also. When only one or two teeth are to be treated, it's better to give local infiltration for these teeth. Sometimes we require a bloodless field in the area of treatment. So in this case, we need local infiltration to achieve hemostasis in the area. For this block, we use a 27 gauge long needle. The area of needle insertion is the height of the mucobuccal fold over the first premolar. You may wonder why we can't go over any other tooth. Actually, we can reach our target area which is the infraorbital foramen from any tooth from the second premolar to the central incisor. But if we go from the first premolar, we get the shortest route to this target area. So that's the reason we insert the needle over the first premolar. The landmarks here which should be palpated are the mucobuccal fold, infraorbital notch and the infraorbital foramen. The bevel of the needle should be towards bone as with every block that we have seen so far. The reason for this is the same. When the bevel faces bone, it glides over the bone when the needle contacts bone. If bevel faces away from the bone, the sharp point of the needle can tear the periosteum and this will be painful for the patient. And in this nerve block, we want to direct the local anesthetic solution towards the infraorbital foramen. So that's why bevel should be facing bone. Patient should be seated in a supine position with the neck extended slightly. 
Next, we should prepare the tissues at the needle insertion site. So the tissues are dried with a sterile gauze and a topical antiseptic and a topical anesthetic is applied. The topical anesthetic should be kept for a minimum of 1 minute. Now we locate the infraorbital foramen. So this is the infraorbital foramen and we can locate it by palpating certain landmarks. First we palpate the infraorbital notch. Then while applying gentle pressure to the tissues, we move the finger downwards. Immediately inferior to this notch, we will feel an outward bulge. This is the lower border of the orbit and the roof of the infraorbital foramen. As we move the finger downwards, we will feel a concavity or a depression. This is the infraorbital foramen. We have to be very gentle while palpating this area as the patient will feel a little bit of soreness because the infraorbital nerve is getting pressed against the bone. Now that we have found the foramen, we should keep the finger here or else mark the area over the skin. Now we should retract the lip and pull the tissues to make it taut. For retracting, we can use our own finger or a mouth mirror. Using the mirror is better as it will protect us from needle stick injury. Now we insert the needle into the height of the mucobuccal fold over the first premolar with the bevel of the needle facing bone. The needle should be parallel to the long axis of the tooth otherwise we might contact bone too soon. So the syringe is oriented towards the infraorbital foramen. The needle is parallel to the long axis of the tooth and now the needle is advanced slowly until bone is contacted. So keep in mind that we don't have to direct the needle towards the bone. If we do that, we might contact bone before we reach the infraorbital foramen. And this will be just like local infiltration over the first premolar. This will result in failure of the nerve block. So always keep the needle straight towards the infraorbital foramen and parallel to the first premolar. For maximum comfort of the patient, it's good to deposit a few drops of local anesthetic as the needle passes through the soft tissues. The depth of needle penetration is 16 mm. So this means that when about half of the needle is in the tissues, this depth is achieved and at this depth, usually we should contact bone. When I say that we contact bone, we are contacting the upper rim of the infraorbital foramen. This contact with the bone at the roof of the infraorbital foramen prevents overinsertion and puncture of the orbit. Depth of penetration can be different for different patients. Some patients have a deep mucobuccal fold and some can have a low infraorbital foramen. So these patients will require less tissue penetration. So to decide how much depth we need to reach the infraorbital foramen, we can place one finger on the infraorbital foramen and another finger intraorally on the injection site in the mucobuccal fold. And we can estimate the distance between these two fingers and in this way, we will get to know how much depth of penetration we will need. Before injecting the solution, we should aspirate in two planes and slowly deposit 0.9 to 1.2 ml of solution over 30 to 40 seconds. We will see little or no swelling as we deposit the solution because the solution is directed towards the foramen the reason we keep a finger over the foramen while injecting is that if the needle tip is in correct position, we will be able to feel the anesthetic solution as we inject. When we finish injecting the solution, because of the volume of the solution, now we won't be able to feel the foramen. Another important reason of placing the finger here is that when we keep firm pressure over the injection site both during the injection and for one minute after the injection 
it increases the diffusion of the local anesthetic solution into the infraorbital foramen. We should keep the finger pressure over the injection site for a minimum of 1 minute after the injection and 2 minutes is even more preferable. The finger over this area will also help us to direct the needle towards the foramen. When the needle is in correct position, the needle should not be palpable. If we can feel the needle then it means that it is too superficial and away from the bone. If this happens, we need to withdraw it slightly and redirect it towards the foramen. As with other nerve blocks, we will have to wait 3 to 5 minutes before we start the procedure. Subjective signs and symptoms like tingling and numbness of the lower eyelid, side of the nose and upper lip indicate that the infraorbital nerve is anesthetized. This doesn't mean that the anterior and middle superior alveolar nerves are anesthetized because as we learnt, anesthesia of the infraorbital nerve will produce only soft tissue anesthesia and this happens quickly as soon as we inject the local anesthetic solution. After this, within 3 to 5 minutes, the teeth in the distribution of the anterior superior alveolar and middle superior alveolar nerve are also anesthetized. Objective signs can be determined using an electric pulp test or a freezing spray. No response from the teeth on maximal electric pulp test output indicates that the teeth are anesthetized. Absence of pain during treatment is also an important symptom that the block has worked. So basically these subjective and objective signs and symptoms are for us to know whether the block has worked and whether we can start the procedure. Advantage is that it's a simple and safe technique. In one injection we get anesthesia of 5 teeth. So this reduces the volume of local anesthetic that we need. With the infraorbital nerve block we need only 0.9 to 1.2 ml and for separate local infiltrations of these teeth we would have needed 3 ml of total volume of local anesthetic. So that's an advantage. Sometimes if the dentist is not experienced with this nerve block there may be fear of injury to the eye. But this fear is fortunately not valid when you follow proper protocol. This nerve block has a high success rate. So this is just a psychological disadvantage. But with experience, it's not really a disadvantage. And rarely there could be a difficulty in identifying the anatomical landmarks like the infraorbital foramen. So that could be a disadvantage. So this was the intraoral technique of infraorbital nerve block. I hope you guys are enjoying the videos on nerve blocks. Thank you for 600 subscribers. I know you guys will help me reach 1000 very soon. So please share my videos and give me your feedback on how I could improve more. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. I'll see you very soon. Bye.